It was a name that sounded so sweet, so seductive. Synonymous with words, style, power. But their name was a curse too. I've been a Gucci all my life. Your name is in the history books. Paolo, you are Gucci, you need to dress the part. It's chic. Gucci needs new blood. It's time to take out the trash. You're my family. So am I. You picked a real firecracker. She's a handful. Bravo. Hello, and welcome back to Mix Present Sound for Film and Television Awards season. I'm Tom Kenny. I'm the editor of Mix Magazine, and we're here today to talk about Ridley Scott's House of Gucci. Uh, premiered theatrically in late November, did very well at the box office, uh, getting a lot of attention in all the categories, including Best Sound. Uh, joined today uh, with a team out of the UK. We got James Mather, a supervising sound editor. We've got Paul Massey, as a re-recording mixer on uh, music dialogue. And Neva Deary, uh, with uh, re-recording on a fact side. Uh, they worked at, they mixed the film, edited it remotely, mixed it at Twickenham, Theater 2, I understand, a brand new stage with a DFC and an S6. Uh, that was one of the first films back in uh, with the full crew on the dub stage after the pandemic. So welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Hi. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that struck me uh, when I first saw the film is that we often think about big action, big effects, big explosions as indicating sound. But this is really a tragedy in three acts. It goes from the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. It's a rise and fall of an empire. Uh, those period shifts in sound are often challenging. They're subtle. They might just be backgrounds. They might be a music. But they imply movement through the whole film. James, can we start with you and talk about working on this period piece? That The period is very familiar to the audience. Uh, Yes, yeah, sure. I think I think I, you know. Thinking about the question, it's it's a hard one to really navigate the periods of time more than it was about the locations because uh, the music kind of took care of where we were in the time slice of the movie, but the locations were very much about the characters involved. I mean, obviously, it's a piece all about the all about the people and 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 the, the various different locations. So. Um, Paolo's house had loads of pigeons around it, and it was slightly like a bit of a madhouse. It was a sort of let let to sort of fall um, fall apart a bit. And and the other houses, Maurizio's various houses, had this incredibly austere, um, empty feel to them. Um, and and various the exterior atmospheres kind of gave away whether we were in a city or whether we were in the Alps or. But in terms of the time scale. I think really we we pushed quite hard on the music and let that become the narrative for that. Ours, ours was really to make sure that the locations were very signalled and very different. But they, you know, there's a scene where Maurizio goes in and sees his father. He's sitting in a dark room watching old movies, and that has this. You could almost smell the dust in the air, and it has this kind of. A uh, mausoleum type atmosphere. Again, a very subtle thing. Actually, more often than not, made made by the foley and the and the sort of you know the subtle effects of, the, of what's in the room, rather than the actual place itself. It was a very. It, it was actually like a very old school film track. It, it it didn't rely on a huge amount, but what it did rely on had to be absolutely spot on. Fireplaces were a really big big ask you know they wanted to make sure that they felt big and strong and that they were the only source of warmth in the room uh even paul i mean feel free to jump in music obviously it takes us to time and place uh, as do uh as do backgrounds Neve. i mean you have cars and vehicles and a city has to sound uh milan has in the 60s in the swing in 60s sounds different than milan in the frenzied 80s um Leave, do you want to start? I mean, sure, sure. So just picking up on what James said, I think, you know, the, uh, it, was, um, it was a lot to do with, with using the right sounds in the right place. 
and to weave them around the dialogue. So, because there was a lot of dialogue, a lot of important dialogues, very intimate scenes, and scenes that, you know, there's, there's a lot of story in the film. And it was very important that the story come through um, throughout. So I think, what well, you know, the main, <laughs> the main job was to, you know, not to disturb the dialogue, and, but still make you feel that you're in the place, that you're in the, the right time, if it's day or night, um, if it's summer or winter and, and, and so on. And just rely more on the intimate effects, like you said, on the foley and between the characters and just makes you feel that you're right in there with them, but not interfere with all the, all the background stuff. But uh, 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 go ahead. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Please. please no, I'm just saying. And the period play comes with the, you know, the, the the correct sirens, the right engines. You know that the vespers were a big a big thing that you know to get the right sound of the vespers sort of echoing in the Italian little alleyways. Um, and so so all these little little nuances made made a big difference, but had to be you know stay away from the dialogue as well. And I, and I love that you mentioned that Italian alleyways, they're sort of cobblestone and narrow. And then you go to New York City, you go to New York City at a certain point, and it becomes more expansive. Paul, can you talk a bit about some of the spaces? Because the locations move a lot. I mean, we have cafes, we have clubs, we have streets, we have homes, we have offices. Um, Paul, those spaces, that variety. Yeah, no, it was actually a great opportunity to to really put different different reverbs and textures on uh, on dialogue and and on crowd reactions and such, um, and as James and Neve have mentioned, that you know I think the period was often conveyed by the by the sound effects when we were in New York. We got a lot of yellow cabs, had to be you know the right the authentic car horns and and car buys. When we we're in Italy, um, our editor Claire Simpson uh, spends a lot of time in Italy, and she she really wanted us to crowd that dialogue with um, in the early part of the film with a lot of vespers and uh, off screen vespers and and cars and horns, and really bring that city alive. Um, and then for dialogue, uh, you know, Ridley always wants, um, or rather, doesn't seem to object <laughs> to. Uh, uh, a rich texture on all the voices once we get in on the interiors, the different reverbs. Um, I, I definitely was allowed to add um, fairly large reverbs to living room settings um, and slaps to dialogue outside outside of the church and the cathedral in, in different squares in Italy. Um, and I always feel like, uh, you know, I'm at, I'm at liberty to to pretty much add whatever I feel to the dialogue to create the environment that we're sitting in. Um, that's one thing I, I really love working with Ridley about that. Oh, I loved it. One of the things that really um, uh, stood out to me was the, the, the richness of the dialogue intimate in this cavernous living room. I mean, we're, the, the, the difference in the living rooms between the Gucci family homes and the Reggiani family homes is uh, <laughs> profound. I mean, it's the, it's the other side of the tracks in a sense. Uh, can you talk about James? I mean, how do you sort of begin? What do you feed Paul to sort of carve out that space where you have a huge living room and a quiet conversation? Uh, I have to give Paul all the credit. Basically, <laughs> yeah. we we, uh, we basically we we accompanied it with Foley, um, and we there was a, there's. I'm glad you mentioned the Reggiani family because when they uh, when they go to when Maurizio goes to the house after he's had an argument with his father. Um, the the neighbour had had to be a little bit kind of disrupted, and there had to be sounds there that you wouldn't hear in a very expensive neighbourhood. It had to have we had to give it the the vibe of there being uh, dogs barking and a, a little bit of night activity. The taxi had to keep ticking over, which kind of gives you a sense that nobody really wants to hang around too long. So that vibe was very different. And the office space when she arrives in the first part of the, the movie, when she arrives and turns up, and all the guys are playing football and wolf whistling and howling and that kind of um, rustic uh, working class Italian um, bon humeur was great because it was such a part of part of making these austere rooms and this and this uh, vacant wealth really stand out was by making all the other sections really busy and and uh, boisterous and kind of full of the Italian energy that you expect um, and the streets like you said with all the with all the vespers and everything else that contrast was what enabled us to have these mausoleum like interiors 
in the in the hotels and in the in the Gucci household. And I think you know that contrast was was what made the difference for me. And so, Paul, take off it if you would, Paul and Dean, because you have you mentioned earlier, Dean, that attention to a single detail can often suck you into a room. Um, and yet, Paul, at the same time, you're carving out that room to hear these quiet conversations. Um, you were together at the final then, correct? I mean, you're, you're able to, uh, yeah. So can you talk a little bit about that dance between the clarity of the dialogue and the detail of the space? Well, I think, I mean, um, as, as we talked about, you know, when, you, when we went into Jeremy Irons' house, um, that was a very austere, very, very wealthy, very quiet, very uh, intimate space. With no with no real fun going on in this inside that house. I mean, it, and I think Neve uh, and James, you know, put together a um, like you you'd hear a grandfather clock in in the distance. You'd hear time ticking. You'd hear um, you know outside birds potentially getting in through through a window. They're chirping, but you you didn't hear any traffic. You didn't hear any um, other side of the tracks, as James put it. Um, noise. This this was a very wealthy residents but it was also lacking in love and and a very dark sort of um bare barren place and then when we get to places like new york and we're inside you know we have al pacino he's very very vibrant he's very charismatic uh, we're in the gucci store he's loving everyone he's interacting with all the clients and, you know, at that point we've got you know needs adding a lot of background Walla and and foley and activity and dress movements and traffic and there's everything you would expect from a from a um, you know a happy place. So I think those contrasts, um, you know, there's there's no real sort of huge action action scenes in this film, um, so you don't have the sort of the contrast of the dynamic scenes um, against a quiet dialogue scene. But what we do have is the contrast of the dialogue scene sitting in different environments and with different emotions. And I think... Do you not... Do you... One of the things I was thinking, Paul, when you were talking then, there's a scene at the nightclub when she's in her element and, uh, you know, she's, she's Patrizia is with her social group and it's really loud. And part of the reason that we had to make it so busy was because Ridley insisted on playing music while they were doing the dialogue scenes so that they were forcing their performance against the oh, sound and uh, paul did the most incredible job of cleaning up so that we didn't we they could cut the dialogue without really worrying too much about the sound in the background because paul tidied it in a way that we didn't re you, it you wouldn't hear it it was so so carefully and deftly filtered and and worked that we managed to retain 85 percent of their original dialogue throughout that whole scene and still give it all the energy and everything else on top and Neve went through the process of making sure that where we needed extra movement whether it was ice pouring in a bucket over a particularly noisy bit of dialogue or whatever that gave energy to that moment and it's quite a good contrast to her very solitary and very lonely life towards the end of the film compared to her vibrancy as a, as a sort of working girl at the beginning let's let's talk about loneliness then because they are they're, they're with people and they're alone um and neve I've, I've come to understand over time that writing about film sound that often this can be expressed in a single detail a single focused element could you talk to me a bit about the foley track because i think it was excellent from the cafes outside i presume there's a lot of foley in there uh, can you talk to me about that sense of focus and detail to, to present loneliness Sure. Well, you know, it's it's what the guys have mentioned. Uh, first of all, the, the foley was uh, done in the in Twickenham uh, by Adam Manders, um, I believe. Is that right, James? He's the um, um, and it's beautifully recorded, and the spatial spatial recording around it is is perfect. So you know, I always find when 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 premixing the the foley that it's just it's very easily done. You know, you don't need to mess around with it too much. It sort of sits sits uh, very um, very naturally and very quickly in the track um so that was you know that was a good start um you know and and uh, come to loneliness i think what we what we didn't mention is the fact that there's actually not a lot of um score in the film you know there's a lot of source music but um, there's not a lot of music where you um, you know come to expect it sometimes you know normally in in the film so i think what we what we found that actually we have to find the single detail. We have to find 
things that are not constant and you know repetitive through a scene because they are heard all the time. So you're right by noticing the foley because you know we had to rely on the foley. We had to rely on their movements and you know the guys record separate move movement tracks to each character, which you not definitely get every time. And that then gave me the opportunity to really, you know, if someone is doing a, you know, they're Italian. So there's a lot of head movements and a lot of, you know, gestures that, you know, come with words or without words, or they just do it with their, with their hands. So we have to sort of emphasize those. Um, and we had the opportunity to really just isolate characters and their, um, what's going, you know, what they're doing on screen and just sort of honed in on that. One of the scenes that struck me, literally, because that fully can, the sound can provide silence almost. I mean, it can provide real isolation by a single sound. A single piano note is famous for that, right? It can break down the level. Um, but stripping away the sounds and keeping a dynamic track, one of the ones on the runway when Paolo gets arrested, I, 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 for some reason I love the scene as his wife singing the, the opera, and you're pulling everything away and to me it's almost encapsulates the isolation of the movie i mean the police raid happens the place is cleared and she's standing there singing alone and you're sort of pulling away i mean could you was it a fun scene or did you just run through it uh, it's a fabulous scene that and, and it's so yeah. he's so triumphant he's so joyous he's so happy that he's finally getting what he wants emotionally and then it's you know he's he's very sort of offhand when the police come in oh another parking ticket um not realizing what's going on and and the fact that it all gets stripped away from him so very very quickly and his wife is also with the emotional connection singing her heart out on the you know out by the runway and doing a great performance by the way which was live uh and and then everyone disappears everyone clears out there's a great echoey door slam off in the distance just signaling that they're that's it they're alone they're done the dream is over and and he comes out just crying going what what yeah, it's, it's glorious it's, 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 it's glorious so <laughs> heart heart wrenching she just stands there. she's finished she finishes wow. singing without finishing the phrase um and then that great moment um that claire put together where where um he he screams out why uh, and and it turns into the car horn outside and moves us into the next scene. It's a great transition. Yeah. James, you want to say anything about that scene? It's a, excellent. No, I just it's it's the inglorious nature of of fame and stardom and, the, and that you have it today, lose it tomorrow. But that divert that again, it's the way that that Claire put it together with with Ridley, the notion that you would go from one extreme to the other within. Uh, you know, within a shot or within a sequence, and it it was that contrast that gave us the opportunity to to let sound have its moment and let silence have its moment, have its moment which is equally important. And Neve, I would say, I mean, it almost encapsulates the scene. But you must have just been pulling, you know, the police away, pulling the Russell away, pulling the banging chairs away, yeah. and then it comes down. And yeah, but all I remember from that is moving that door about a hundred times to find, <laughs> the door. To find, to find the right moment. And it's not, Where does it's the not door go? Singing, and it's not on his breath, and it's not on them, but it's, you know. But anyway, that that's just a, it's a funny thing, but it, it's actually, you know, sometimes takes a long time, and you have to run back and see the whole thing, the whole sequence, and see that, like I said, we're pulling everything at the right moment, the footstep goes away, the crowd goes away and and all you hear is these sort of distance footsteps and the door at the right moment so yeah it, it was again it's it's fun to do these things but it's just a lot of back and forwards <laughs> it's a it's a it's a very interesting soundtrack for subjectivity because it allows everybody to have to share opinions about where certain detail should sit and quite often it's obvious because there's so much going on it's just part of it but where there's so little, it's very important. The subject, there were a lot of discussions throughout the mix. Everybody, you know, wanted to sort of have a think about where their preference of things would go. Um, and that's, 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 that's part of the craft. 
which I love. I think that's a really important part. Very, of it. very interesting because we do shift. I mean, we start with her narration, right? We start with uh, Patricia's narration. So it opens the show, if I'm, if I'm correct. And we sort of shift perspectives. We get into Mauricio's head at times. We're moving. We get into Aldo's head, certainly in Paolo. I thought Paolo's an underrated performance. I thought he was great. Uh, but that's that shift throughout. Are you looking at it from different characters' point of views? James, you want to start with that? I mean, I, I think you're looking at I think you're looking at the soundtrack from from the timing of the cut and the perspective of the characters, and you're looking at the narrative of the story that the sound is helping to tell. And if it's a lonely, if it's a point of loneliness, then it is that one single sound. And if it's a point of festivity and and joy, then it's the laughter that appears at a certain point. But it's it the, the unlike an action movie, the, there is much more scrutiny when there's less to less to express yourself with and i thought that this was a really again going back to the fact that we were all on the stage together we were all sharing the experience together and um it, it was a it was a joy to be going through that process and having a soundtrack that enabled us to be subjective and that we could discuss and have considerations over different things um we had the right amount of time to do it, uh, what we felt was a, a pretty good job um, and, and enjoy, know that everything that we've done was in the right way for the right reason. Right. Just a round table, one of your favorite scenes to work on that you weren't expecting because it might not be obvious to the audience um, in, a, in a sort of dialogue driven film, in a story driven film like this. James, do you want to start it off? What was one of your favorite to work on that surprised you? Oh, uh... Uh, I would say one of my favourite scenes. Um, uh, Paolo always had me in tux whenever he. I think one of my favourite scenes was when um, uh, Al Pacino comes out of prison and they're at their house together. Uh, he's at his son's house, and there is just there's just a chemistry between those two, and there's a there's an energy that they convey. Um, and there's and to be fair, there's nothing that we could do. For, with that scene that, that wasn't already in the performance, it was all about them. But that, I, that, that those two guys together on the screen really fizzled for me. I really, I loved it. I, they it fizzed, and, and they were that, that scene particularly really worked in, hard. In music, we say it starts with the song, and in film, it starts with the performance. Yeah. Uh, Neve, do you have a you have a scene? There? Um, well, I particularly proud. Um, I think I I really enjoyed. The, um, there's quite a few places where there's like montages and things that they build around music and I really enjoyed I love this all the source music in the film you know a lot of it is some of my favorite tracks you know I kind of you know really like those sort of uh, 70s uh, uh, tracks so um, I always like to you know if there's a montage to, to find the right sounds to sort of weave in the music in the moment and and to work together around the music so you don't hear everything but you hear a detail on every shot that will tell the story. So I, I, I always enjoyed doing these sort of things and what footsteps you hear, what you don't hear around the dialogue in those montage um, things that works around the music. So that that's my always favorite. I like I like that one of music with it, it, near the end. Well, um, spoiler alert: um, there's a murder. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but but when he's riding when he's riding his bicycle and we have that music and he's going to the cobblestones yeah. and there's some detail there's some bike bike chains in there there's That's some right, yeah. you know, there's some street sounds but they're lowered um, yeah it's just every every that. shot uh, you know every shot you just choose a, a, a good sound and sort of champion that um yeah, yeah. so that, that that's always my yeah, favorite pa thing. Paul, I, I heard every word. First, that's a good thing. Um, and we should give a shout out to uh, uh, Stefan Boucher. Is, is he the production yeah. sound? Yeah, Boucher? great job. Yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, a great job because that's it's it's an intensive, lots of indoor and outdoor. It's a great job. So, uh, uh, music and dialogue. I mean, what are, what are, what scenes sort of struck you? Well, actually, one of my favorite scenes has, I believe, no music and it's almost no sound effects. It's when. Um, Al Pacino and Paolo are at the boardroom table inside of the, the sort of very classy wooden room. And he's, he realizes that he's been betrayed uh, and he needs to sign over his, his, uh, his whole life, his whole his, his method of income, everything that he's ever lived for. And it's, it's a fairly long scene, but it's, it's incredibly well directed. It's really, really well performed. 
every character in there is is giving you know 100 percent and um one of my favorite memories of mixing the film was the last playback we did for ridley um with everyone in in the room and he sat there and he was laughing his head off with joy about the anguish that al pacino was going through <laughs> he was sitting right next to me at the console and I remember looking over and he's like that was fantastic isn't it it's fantastic and it's true it was absolutely mesmerizing um but hats off also to, to james and neve there because we kept that very purposely almost anechoic you couldn't hear anything through those heavy wooden doors um and it's one of my favorite scenes one of the other things i really like is the uh, uh, neve mentioned um montages but there's a there's a David Bowie cue uh, in in the film towards the end um, that creates a great vibe for a montage of of what we see going on. And um, there's an awful lot of needle drop within the film from very dissimilar styles of music, and they seem to work very very well together to lead the story along. Um, and Oh, I love I love the Italian pop of the sixties, you know, and things like that. It was, you're in a swinging club, and you have sort of uh, I think there's even a, uh, not painted black, but there's like an Italian version of a rock and roll song. Uh, and then on top of that, you've got Harry Gregson Williams' great score as well. So you know, it was yeah, really yeah, a very like very colorful music track. Well, well, I'm glad you all got to sit in a room together. <laughs> that, that's that must have been a big break after all these years, and I'm glad. People got to see this in Atmos in uh, theaters. Uh, yep. Good to be back, gentlemen. And thank you. Thank you. A lot of great work coming out of the UK, by the way. It's, it's happening you, right now. Uh, oh, thank you, Tom. Everywhere. Everywhere, sir. Thank you. Long may yeah, keep coming. So thank you, gentlemen. And thank you to United Artists for releasing. Thank you. thank you to all the people who support us. And now go out and vote for the shortness, people. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. <laughs>